Can you invest in venture capital firms? Historically, investing in VC has been exclusively for the rich. Stick around though to the end and I'll reveal my secret that will help you invest without being fabulously rich. Although, I won't lie, it does help. So let's start. What is a venture capital fund? Well, a venture capital fund is an entity that is designed to take investors' money and invest it in startups. So as a venture capitalist, like part of my job is I go out and I meet with uh, investors and try to convince them to invest in my fund. I pool all that capital together into my fund and then I go out and I find companies to invest that capital through. And then when those companies perform well, like they get acquired or they go public, then I sell my shares, I take that money and I distribute it back out to my investors, which are called limited partners. So that's how a venture capital fund works. Let's say you want to invest. Well, you would invest as a limited partner. Now, what does that mean, a limited partner? A limited partner is somebody that is limited in the amount of say they have into what the company, the fund can invest in. That's why they're called a limited partner, but really they're just the investor in the fund. And they are part of a limited partnership. If you wanna learn more about that, we've got lots of content around what are limited partners and how are funds structured and so on and so forth. But today, let's just focus on becoming an investor in a venture fund. So how does it work? Well, unlike a lot of funds where like, oh, I wanna invest in Tesla. I'm just gonna open up my Robinhood account. I'm gonna put in some money from my bank account and then I'm gonna buy Tesla shares, right? Super easy. Well, in venture capital, it's a little bit different. Instead of making an investment where you just deploy all the cash, you're actually gonna make a commitment to invest. So day one, you may not actually give them any money, but instead what will happen is you'll sign the documents and on those documents, you'll say, I commit for the next 10 years to invest X amount of dollars. So maybe it's $10,000, maybe it's $100,000, Maybe it's a million dollars, right? Whatever that number is. So over the next 10 years, the venture capitalist will periodically call you up and they'll say, hey, remember how you committed to invest that money in my fund? Well, now I need that cash and I'll need some percentage of it because they don't want, they're not gonna call all of it. Instead, they'll say, hey, we're gonna invest in Spotify. We're gonna invest you know, 10% of the fund in Spotify, which means I need 10% of your commitment. So you wire that over, they'll collect all the commitments together, and then they'll invest that in the fund. Well, during the first three to five years, and it depends by venture fund, so you just have to read through the docs, but in the first three to five years is when a venture fund places its bets. And that's when typically the majority of the capital is gonna get called. Now, it also depends on their strategy. So in some cases, if they're doing super, super early stage investing, but they reserve, a lot of cash for follow-on investments. It may be pretty equally spread out over the 10 years. Or in other cases, like our fund, we're a growth equity fund. We don't reserve a ton of money like other funds do. And so we may call more of that money during the investment period. But either way, you should plan on kind of the majority of the cash going out during that investment period when they're placing their bets. So most of the capital goes out in the beginning. And then over time, they'll call the rest of the capital to pay fees and also to do follow-on investments as those companies need more money. Now, in the first three to five years, you're probably losing money on a venture capital investment. That's kind of an interesting thing, right? The reason for that is what happens is you put money in, right? So I commit a million dollars and then the fund says, okay, hey, in year one, we need 10% and year, or 20% and year two, we need 15% and year three, we need, you know, 20%, whatever that number is. So I'm investing, I'm wiring them all this money. But those companies, they take time to grow and mature. And there are expenses to running a fund. So day one, you're losing money because your investments haven't gone up in value yet, on paper at least, and all you've had are expenses. And then over time, right, what happens is those companies start performing and your investment starts to grow. And this is what we call the J-curve because day one, you start losing money on paper and then over time, you start gaining money. And then the companies in the like second half of those, that 10 years, they start exiting. They go public, they get acquired, maybe they go file bankruptcy. But either way, the stuff that's on paper suddenly becomes real. And hopefully if you've done a good job investing in great managers and great venture capitalists, you start generating cash flows back in the second half of those 10 years. That's the harvest period. So that's 
kind of soup to nuts the the whole way that uh, investing in venture capital works. Over time, what'll happen is you'll make your commitment at the beginning and then they'll call capital. So you'll pay that in. They'll make investments with that capital. Those, those investments will hopefully perform. They'll go public, they'll get acquired. They'll return cash back to you. And then at the end of the day, you'll get somewhere between typical funds target somewhere between three to five times your investment. Funds that do earlier stage investing like seed stage may have higher targets and funds that do later stage growth equity investing may have lower targets, but they're lower risk, right? And so there's just that trade-off. Like a seed stage fund, you might lose, you, you, there's a high degree of likelihood that you could lose all of your investment. But there's also a degree of likelihood that you could return. You might return five, 10, 15, 20 times your investment over that investment horizon. In growth equity investing, it's probably lower likelihood that you're gonna lose money. I mean, it's still a likelihood, but you're also you know, not gonna receive like 20 times your investment most likely. So that's what you should expect. Now, every fund has different minimums. So that's another thing you have to take in, con into consideration. Most funds on paper will say the minimum is $500,000 in order to invest. Here's the thing, a little bit of a dirty secret, most funds will be f flexible on that amount, especially if they're earlier stage. And when I say earlier stage, that you know they're on fund one, fund two, fund three. They're what we, we call in the industry an emerging manager. If they're further along and there's lots of demand to invest in their fund, it may be really hard to invest no matter what the minimum is. So it just depends on the fund. But just because they put 500K on paper doesn't mean that that's non-negotiable. So feel free to push back on that a little bit. The bigger issue than the minimum is that you have to meet certain requirements under the SEC. The SEC has come out and said that it wants to protect kind of average investors from being scammed out of their money. And so they require uh, most companies that are going to raise money to be registered with them. If, they're, if a company or an entity is not gonna get, be registered with them, then they have to, that company or entity, as in a fund, has to ensure that all of their company, all of their investors are accredited or qualified clients. And that is a pretty substantial bar. So to be an accredited investor, which is kind of the bare minimum, you have to have $200,000 of annual income, or if you include joint income, 300,000, or you have to have a million dollars of net assets outside of your primary residence. So that's a pretty big hurdle. It gets even worse though. If you're accredited, you can have up to 100 investors in a fund or in an entity, but if you want more than 100, then everybody has to be a qualified client. And the bar for being a qualified client is you have to have $2.1 million in net assets. So these bars are really high, right? And that's why you know investing in venture capital is, is one of those areas in which the rich have access to inv amazing investment opportunities that aren't available to everybody else. And because of that, it's one reason why the rich keep getting richer and richer. That said, there are some workarounds. So let's talk about that because you stuck around to the end. So let's give you that reward. All right, but here's the cool thing. You don't have to be fabulously wealthy anymore in order to become an accredited investor. It is challenging. There's no workaround for being a qualified investor, but I'm gonna tell you some ways in which you can still invest in venture capital funds as an accredited investor and how to become accredited without having a ton of money. So in 2020, the SEC re kind of reevaluated the regulations around accredited investor, and they added a whole bunch of interesting provisions that allowed more people to become accredited. One of those provisions was that you could in become accredited if you had passed certain exams and held certain certifications and were in good standing. The SEC delineated that those exams to include and, and certifications the Series 7, the Series 65, and the Series 82 now under FINRA. These are certifications and designations that investment advisors receive after taking specific tests. Now, the Series 7 and the Series 82 require that you are sponsored, which means you work for an investment bank or an insurance company or a wealth advisor, and they sponsor you. And so you are typically an employee with that bank. So for example, most investment bankers carry a Series 7 license 
and they work for a brokerage, an investment bank investment banking brokerage. This would be similar to having like your real estate license and working for a real estate brokerage, uh, except for investment banking, instead of selling houses, you're selling companies. That's what investment bankers do. But the Series 65 does not require a sponsor. And so you can actually go and take the exam and after you pass it, you can then qualify as an accredited investor. Now, most funds are still gonna require that you're a qualified client and meet that $2.1 million threshold. However, there are some funds that are smaller that you can invest in as an accredited investor. And one of the interesting ways that, or interesting ways that you can do that is through AngelList Ventures. AngelList Ventures is a really cool model where successful angel investors have been able to go on and launch a fund without all of the headache and, and hard work that's traditionally goes into raising a fund. The way they do that is they do it on the subscription model through AngelList Ventures. For example, they will kind of walk you through their investment thesis and then they'll say, hey, if this investment thesis sounds good to you, you can sign up and invest on an annual basis. And those minimums can be pretty low. Like in some cases, it's like $10,000 a year. And so once a quarter or certain, you know, once a month, they'll actually call the capital from you so if it's $10,000, they'll call, you know, $2,500 a quarter, and then they'll invest that money over the course of the year, and they'll charge the traditional standard fees of 2% management fee and 20% carry. But in those cases, you just have to be accredited, uh, and in most of those cases, you don't have to be qualified. So that can be another interesting way to participate in venture capital uh, that's a little bit more accessible. The other thing that the SECs put in their regs is that if you work for a venture capital fund, you may also potentially qualify as an accredited investor. So stay tuned for our next video where we're gonna talk about what it takes to become a venture capitalist.